we spent the last few lectures discussing Semiramis regularity lemma. And so we saw that this is an important tool with important applications, uh, allowing you to do things like a proof of Ross theorem via graph theory. One of the concepts that came up when we were discussing the statement of Semiramis regularity lemma is that of pseudo randomness. So the statement of Semiramis graph regularity lemma is that you can partition an arbitrary graph into a bounded number of pieces so that the graph looks random-like, as we call it, between most pairs of parts. Okay, so what does random-like mean? So that's something that I want to discuss for the next couple of lectures. And this is the idea of pseudo-randomness. which is a, it's a concept that you know, is really prevalent in combinatorics, in theoretical computer science, and in many different areas. And what pseudo-randomness tries to capture is in what ways can a non-random object look random? All right, so before diving into some specific mathematics, I want to offer some philosophical remarks. Right, so you might know that you know, in com on a computer, you want to generate a random number, well, you type in a rand and it gives you a random number. But of course, you know, that's not necessarily true randomness. It came from some pseudo-random generator. Uh, you know, probably there's some seed and some complex looking function and output something that you couldn't distinguish from random. But it might not actually be random. It's just something that looks in many different ways like random. So there is this concept of random. You can think about a random graph, right? Generate this Erdős radian random graph. Every edge occurs independently with some probability. But I can also show you some graph, some specific graph, which I say, well, it's just for all intents and purposes, just as good as a random graph. So in what ways can we capture that concept? So that's what I want to discuss. And that's the topic of pseudo-randomness. And of course, well, you know, this idea extends to you know, many areas, number theory and whatnot, but we'll stick with graph theory. And in particular, I want to explore today just one specific notion of pseudo-randomness. And this is, comes from an important paper called Quasi-Random Graphs. And this concept is due to Chung, Graham, and Wilson back in the late 80s. So they defined various notions of pseudo-randomness. And I want to state them. And what it turns out, and the, the surprising part is that these notions, these definitions, although they look superficially different, they're actually all equivalent to each other. So let's see what the theorem says. All right, so the setup of this theorem is that you have some fixed real p between 0 and 1. And this is going to be your graph edge density. So for any sequence of graphs, gn. Okay. So with, so from now I'm going to drop the subscript g. So the subscript n, so g will just be gn, such that the number of vertices, so, so G is N vertex with edge density basically P. Okay, so this is your sequence of graphs. And the claim is that we're going to state some set of properties and these properties are all going to be equivalent to each other. Okay, so all of these properties capture some notion of pseudo-randomness. Okay, so in what ways does this graph G, or really a sequence of graphs, or 
you can talk about a specific graph and have some error parameters and error bounds. They're all roughly the same ideas. Okay. So in what ways can we talk about this graph G being random-like? Well, we already saw one notion when we discussed Semiradi's regularity lemma. And let's see that here. So this notion is known as discrepancy. And it says that if I restrict my graph to looking only at edges between some pair of vertex sets, then the number of edges should be roughly what you would expect based on density alone. Right? So this is basically the notion that came up in epsilon regularity. Right? This is essentially the same as saying that G is epsilon regular with itself, where this epsilon now is hide, hidden in this little old parameter. Okay? So that's one notion of pseudo-randomness. Okay, so here's another notion which is very similar. Uh, so it's almost just a semantic difference, but okay, so I have to do a little bit of work. So let me call this disk prime. So it says that if you look at only edges within a set, so instead of taking two sets, I only look at one set, and then look at how many edges are in there versus how many you should expect based on density alone, these two numbers are also very similar to each other. All right, so let's get to something that looks dramatically different. The next one I'm going to call count. So count says that for every graph H, the number of labeled copies of H in G. Okay, so labeled copies, I mean that the vertices of H are labeled. Right, so you know, for every triangle, there are six labeled triangles that correspond to that triangle in the graph. So number of labeled copies of H is, okay, so what should you expect? If this graph were truly random, you expect P raised to the number of edges of H plus a small error times N number raised to the number of vertices of H. Okay. Um, and just as a remark, this little old term, little old one term, may depend on H. Okay. So this condition count says for every graph H, this is true, and by that I mean for every H, there is some sequence of decaying errors, but that sequence of decaying errors may depend on your graph H. Okay. The next one is almost a special case of count. It's called C4. And it says that the number of labeled copies of C4, so the four cycle, is at most p raised to the power 4. Okay, so again, what you should expect in a random setting. Just four cycle count alone. Okay, so I see already some of you are surprised. And so we'll discuss that you know, this is an important constraint. It turns out that alone implies everything just having the correct C4 count. The next one we'll call code degree. And the code degree condition says that if you look at a pair of vertices and look at their number of common neighbors, in other words, their code degree, then well, what should you expect this quantity to be? Well, so there are n vertices that possibly could be common neighbors, and each one of them, well, if this were a random graph with edge probability p, then you expect the number of common neighbors to be around p cubed of p squared n. So the code degree condition is that this sum is small. Right? So most 
pairs of vertices have roughly the correct number of common neighbors. degree, there's number of common neighbors. Next, and the last one, but certainly not the least, is an eigenvalue condition. So here we are going to denote by lambda 1 through lambda g the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of G. Okay, so we saw this object in the last lecture. Okay, so you have, so I include multiplicities if some eigenvalue occurs with multiple times, I include it multiple times. Right, so the eigenvalue condition says that the top eigenvalue is around Pn and that, more importantly, the other eigenvalues are all quite small. Now, for a deregular graph, the top eigenvalue, okay, and it's fine to think about deregular graphs, uh, you know, if you want to get some intuition out of this theorem. For a deregular graph, the top eigenvalue is equal to D because the top eigenvector is D, right? There's the O1 vector. So the top eigenvector is O1 vector, which has eigenvalue D. And what the eigenvalue condition says is that all the other eigenvalues are much smaller. Right, so here I'm thinking of D as on the same order of, as N. Okay, so this is the theorem. Okay, so that's what we'll do today. We'll prove that all of these properties are equivalent to each other. And all of these properties you should think of as characterizations of pseudo-randomness. And of course this theorem guarantees us that you know, it doesn't matter which one you use, they're all equivalent to each other. Right? And you know, our proofs are actually going to be, uh, I mean, I'm going to try to do everything fairly slowly, but none of these proofs are difficult. We're not going to use any fancy tools like Samaritis Regularity Lemma. And in particular, all of these quantitative errors are reasonably dependent on each other. Right? So I've stated this theorem so far in this form where there's a little one error, but equivalently, so can equivalently state them State theorem as, um, you know, for example, have disk with an epsilon error, right, and which is that some inequality is true with at most epsilon error instead of little o, and you have a different epsilon for each one of them, and the theorem it turns out that. Okay, so the proof of the theorem will be that these conditions are true, so all equivalent up to at most a polynomial change in the epsilons. Okay, so in other words, so property one is true for epsilon implies that property two is true for some epsilon raised to a constant. Right, so the, the changes in parameters are quite reasonable. And we'll see this from the proof, but I won't say it again explicitly. Okay. Any questions so far about the statement of this theorem? So as I mentioned just now the most surprising part of this theorem, and the one that I want you to pay the most attention to, is the C4 condition. Right. This seems, at least at face value, the weakest condition among all of them. It just says the correct C4 count. But it turns out to be equivalent to everything else. 
And there's something special about C4, right? If I replace C4 by C3 by just triangles, then it is not true. So I want you to think about you know, where does C4 play this important role? And how does it play this important role? Okay, so let's get started with the proof. But before that, let me, um, so in this proof, one recurring theme is that we're going to be using the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality many times. And I want to just begin with an exercise that gives you some familiarity with applying the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And this is a simple tool, but it's extremely powerful and it's worthwhile to you know, master how to use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Okay, so let's, let's get some practice. And let me prove a claim which is not directly uh, related to the proof of the theorem, but it's indirectly in, in that it explains somewhat the C4 condition, you know, why we have less than or equal to over there. Okay, so the lemma is that if you have a graph on n vertices such that the number of edges is at least p n squared over two, so edge density basically P, then the number of labeled copies of C4 is at least P to the fourth minus little one and to the fourth. So if you have a graph with edge density p, p is a constant, then the number of c fours is at least roughly what you would expect in a random graph. All right. So let's see how to do this. And I want to show this inequality as a, well, I mean, I'll show you how to prove this inequality, but I also want to draw a sequence of pictures um, that at least to explain how I think about applications of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Okay, so the first thing is that we are counting labeled copies of C4. And this is basically, but not exactly the same as number of homomorphic copies of C4 and G. So by this guy here, I really just mean um, you are mapping vertices of C4 to G so that the edges all map to edges, but we are allowing not necessarily injective maps, C4 to, to G. But that's okay. So the number of non-injective maps is at most cubic, so we're not really affecting our count. So it's enough to think about homomorphic copies. Okay, so what's going on here? So let me draw a sequence of pictures illustrating this calculation. So first, we are thinking about counting C4s. Okay, so that's, that's a C4. I can rewrite the C4 count as a sum over pairs of vertices of G as the squared co-degree. And what happens here, so this is true. I mean, it's not hard to see why this is true, but I want to draw this in pictures because you know, when you have larger and bigger graphs, it may be more difficult to think about the algebra unless you have some visualization. So what happens here is that I notice that the C4 has a certain reflection. Namely, it has a reflection along this horizontal line. And so if I put these two vertices as u and v, then this reflection tells you that you can write this homomorphic number of homomorphic copies as the sum of squares. But once you have this reflection, and reflections are super useful because they allow us to get something into a square and then right after apply the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So we apply Cauchy-Schwartz here, and we obtain that this, this sum um, is at most, okay, where I can 
pull the square out. And I need to think about what is the correct um, factor to put out here. And that should be, okay, so, so what's the correct factor that I should put out there? Okay, so the one over n squared. So I don't actually like doing this kind of calculations with sums because then you have to keep, a, keep track of these normalizing factors. One of the upcoming chapters when we discuss graph limits, or in fact, you can even do this instead of taking sums, if you take an average, if you take an expectation, then it turns out you never have to worry about these normalizing factors. And so somehow normalizing factors should never bother you if you do it correctly. But just to make sure things are correct, you know, please keep me in check. All right, so what happened in this step? In this step, we pulled out that square. And pictorially, what happens is that we got rid of, of half of this picture. So we used Cauchy Schwartz and we wiped out half of the picture. And now what we can do is, well, we're counting these guys, these paths of length two. But I can reparameterize this picture so that it looks like that. And now I notice that there's one more reflection, right? So there's one more reflection. And that's the reflection around the vertical axis. So let me call this top vertex x. And I can rewrite the sum So once more, we do cauchy Schwartz, which allows us to get rid of, of half of the picture. And now I'm going to draw the picture first. Because then you see that what we should be left with is just a single edge. And then you write down the correct sum, making sure that all the parentheses and normalizations are correct. But somehow that doesn't worry me so much because I know this will definitely work out. But whatever it is, you're just summing the number of edges. So that's just the number of edges. Um, and okay, so we put everything in. And we find that the final quantity is at least p raised to 4, n to 4. OK, so I did this quite slowly, but and also emphasizing the sequence of pictures. Um, and Partly to tell like how I think about these inequalities, because for other similar-looking inequalities, in fact, there is something called Sidorenko's conjecture, which I may discuss more in a future lecture, that says that this kind of inequality should be true whenever you replace C4 by any bipartite graph. And that's a major open problem in combinatorics. It's kind of hard to keep track of these calculations unless you have a visual anchor. And this is my visual anchor, which I'm trying to explain. Yeah, but of course, it's down to earth. It's just the sequence of inequalities. And this is also some practice with Cauchy Schwartz. All right. Any questions? So but one thing that this calculation told us is that if you have edge density p, then you necessarily have c4 density at least p to the fourth. So that partly explains why you have at most then here. So you always know that it is at least this quantity. So the C4 quasi-randomness condition is really the equivalent to replacing this less than or equal to by an equal sign. Okay, so let's get started with proving the chung graham wilson theorem. So the first place that we'll look at is uh, the two versions of disk. So this stands for discrepancy. Okay, so first, the fact that this implies this prime, um, I mean, this is pretty easy. You take y to equal to x. Uh, be slightly careful about the definitions, but you're okay. 
not much to do there. The other direction where you only have discrepancies for single sets and you want to produce discrepancies for pairs of sets. Uh, okay, so this is actually a fairly common technique in algebra uh, that allows you to go from bilinear forms to quadratic forms and vice versa. It's that kind of calculation. So let me do it here concretely in this setting. So here, uh, what you should think of is that you have two sets, X and Y, and they might overlap. And what they correspond to in uh, the, and you think about the corresponding Venn diagram where I'm looking um, at ways that a vertex can fall in, a pair of vertices can fall in X and or Y. So if you have X and Y, and so it's useful to keep track of which vertices are in which set, but what the thing finally comes down to is that the number of edges with one vertex in X and one vertex in Y, I can write this you know, bilinear form type quantity as a course, as an appropriate sum of just number of edges in single sets. And okay, so there are several ways to check that this is true. Um, one way is to just tally, you know, keep track of how many edges are you counting in each step. So if you are trying to count the number of edges in um, yeah, so let's say if you're trying to count the number of edges in um, with one vertex in X, one vertex in Y, then what this corresponds to is that count, but let me do a reflection. And then you see that you can write this sum as a alternating sum of principal squares. So there's one big square plus the middle square and minus the two side squares, which is what that sum comes to. All right, so if we assume this prime, then I know that all of these individual sets have roughly the correct number of edges. up to a little o of n squared error. And again, like I don't have to do this calculation again because it's, it's the same calculation. So the final thing should be p times the sizes of x and y together plus this same error. Okay, so that shows you disk prime implies disk. So the self version of discrepancy implies the pair version of discrepancy. So let's move on to count. To show that disk implies count, actually we already did this. And so this is the counting lemma. So the counting lemma tells us how to count labeled copies if you have these epsilon regularity conditions, which is exactly what disk is. Okay, so the count is good. Okay, another easy implication is count implies C4. Well, this is actually just tautological. Okay, so C4 condition is a special case of, of the count hypothesis. All right, 
So let's move on to some additional uh, implications that require a bit more work. Right? So what about C4 implies cold degree? So this is where we need to do this kind of Cauchy-Schwarz exercise. So let's start with C4. So assume the C4 condition. And suppose you have this, um, okay, so let's, so I want to deduce that the code degree condition is true, but first let's think about just what is the sum of these code degrees as I vary u and v over all pairs of vertices. So, so this is the, that picture. So that is equal to the sums of degrees squared, which now by Cauchy-Schwartz, you can deduce to be at least n times two raised to the number of edges, namely the sum of the degrees, that thing squared. So now we assume the C4 condition. Uh, actually, no, we assume that G has the density as written up there. So this quantity is P squared plus little one times N cubed, which is what you should expect in a random graph of uh, G and P. Okay, so that's, but that's not quite what we're looking for. So this is just the, the sum of the code degrees. What we actually want is the deviation of code degrees from its expectation, so to speak. Now, here's an important technique from probabilistic combinatorics, is that if you want to control the deviation of a random variable, one thing you should look at is the variance. So if you can control the variance, then you can control the deviation. And this is a method known as a second moment method, and that's what we're gonna do here. So what we'll try to show is that the second moment of these code degrees, namely the sum of their squares, is also what you should expect as if it were in the random setting. And then you can put them together to show what you want. So. This quantity here, well, what is this? We just saw, you know, see up there, it's also called degree square, squared. So this quantity is also the number of labeled copies of C4 Not quite, because you might have two vertices ending up in the, at the same vertex, so I, incorporate a small error. So it's really a sub, it's a cubic error, but it's certainly sub uh, n to the four. And we assume that the number of labeled copies of C4 by the C4 condition is no more than basically P to the four times n raised to the power four. Okay, so now you have a first moment, you have some average, and you have some control in the second moment. I can put them together to bound the deviation using this idea of controlling variance. So the code degree deviation is upper bounded by, okay, so here using Cauchy-Schwartz, it's upper bounded by basically the same sum, except I want to square the sum end. This also gets rid of the pesky absolute value sign, which is not nicely algebraically behaved. But, okay, so now I have the square and I can expand the square. So I expand the square into these terms 
final term here is p to 4 and 6. But I've controlled the individual terms from the calculations above. So I can upper bound this expression by what I'm writing down now. And basically, you should expect that everything should cancel out because they do cancel out in the random case, but of course, as a sanity check, it's, you know, it's important to write down this calculation. So if everything works out right, everything should cancel out. And indeed, they do cancel out, and you get that. Uh, so this is a location. Um, I am, this is p squared, right? Is that okay? Right. So everything should cancel out, and you get a little of and cubed. Right, to summarize, in this implication from C4 to, to code degree, what we're doing is we're controlling the variance of code degrees using the C4 condition and a second moment bound, right, showing that the C4 condition you know, trumps over the code degree condition. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'll let you ponder on this calculation. The next one that we'll do is code degree implies a disk. Okay, and that will be a calculation in a very similar flavor. Um, but it will be a slightly longer, but a similar flavor calculation. So let me do that after the break. All right, so what have we done so far? So let's summarize uh, the chain of implications that we have already proved. So first, we started with showing that the two versions of disk are equivalent. And then we also noticed that uh, disk implies count to the counting lemma. So we also observe that count implies C4 tautologically, and C4 implies code degree. Okay, so the next natural thing to do is to complete this, this circuit and show that the code degree condition implies the, the discrepancy condition. So that's what we'll do next. And in some sense, you know, the, these two steps, you should think of them as going in this natural chain where C4, okay, so you know, C4 is well, like this C4. Code degree condition is really about that. And disk is really about single edges. Right, so you can go from you know, double, like, you know, if, you, if you half, you, know, you, you get much more power. Right, so it's going in the right direction, going downstream so to speak. Right, so that's what we're doing now, going downstream. And then you go upstream via the counting lemma. All right, let's do code degree implies disk. So we want to show the discrepancy condition, which is one written up there. But before that, let me first show you that the degrees do not vary too much. Uh, show that the degrees are fairly well distributed, which is what you should expect in a pseudo-random graph. Right? So you don't expect that half the vertices have in degrees twice the other half. Right? So th that's the first thing I want to establish. That if you look at degrees, This variance, this, this deviation is uh, it's not too big. Okay, so like before, we see an absolute value sign, we see a sum, so we'll do Cauchy-Schwartz. Cauchy-Schwartz allows us to bound 
this quantity replacing the summand by a sum of squares. I have a square, so I can expand the square. So let me expand the square. And I get that. Okay, so just expanding this square uh, inside. And you see this degree squared is that picture. So that's sum of co-degrees. Um, and sum of the degrees is just the number of edges. We now assume the co-degree condition, which in particular implies that the sum of the co-degrees is roughly what you would expect. So the sum of the co-degrees should be p squared n cubed plus a little o n cubed error at the end. Likewise, the number of edges is by assumption what you would expect in a random graph. And then the final term. And like before, and of course it's good to do a sanity check, everything should cancel out. So what you end up with is little o of n squared. Okay, showing that the degrees do not vary too much. And once you have that promise, then we move on to the actual discrepancy condition. So, so this discrepancy is, can be rewritten as the sum over vertices little x in big X, um, the degree from little x to y minus p times the size of y. Okay, so rewriting the sum. Of course, what should we do next? Cauchy shorts, great. So we'll do a Cauchy shorts. Okay, so here's a here's a important step or a trick, if you will. So we'll do Cauchy shorts, and something very nice happens when you do Cauchy shorts here. Is that okay? So you can write down the expression that you obtain when you do Cauchy shorts. So let me do that first. So here's a step which is very easy to gloss over, but I, I want to pause and emphasize this step because this is actually really important. What I'm going to do now is to observe that the summon is always non-negative. Therefore, I can enlarge the sum from just little x in x to the entire vertex set. And this is important, right? So this is important that we had to do Cauchy shorts first to get a non-negative summon. You couldn't do this in the beginning. Okay, so you do that. And uh, okay, so I have this sum of squares. So I expand. I expand. I write out all these expressions. And now, the little x range over the entire vertex set. 
what's the point of all of that? So you see this expression here, the degree of from little x to big Y squared. Okay, so what is that? How can we rewrite this expression? So tiny little x and then y squared. Yeah, so the sum of co-degree of two vertices in y. So y, y prime in y, co-degree of little y, little y prime. And likewise, the next expression can be written as the sum of the degrees of vertices in Y. And the third term I leave unchanged. And now we've gotten rid of these you know, funny expressions where it's just degree from a vertex to a set. And we could do this because of this relaxation up here. So that was, that was the point. We had to use this relaxation so that we get these co-degree terms. But now, because you have the co-degree terms, and we assume the co-degree hypothesis, we obtain that this sum is roughly what you expect as in a random case, because all the individual deviations do not add up to more than little o n cubed. Okay. That co-degree sum is, is what you expect. And the next term is the sum of degrees. It's also, by what we did up there, what you expect. Okay. And finally, the third term. And as earlier, if you did everything correctly, everything should cancel. And they do. Okay. And so what you get at the end is little o of n squared. This completes this four cycle. Any questions so far? Okay, so we're missing one more condition, and that's the eigenvalue condition. So so far everything had to do with you know, counting various things. Right? So what does eigenvalue have to do with anything? Eigenvalue condition is actually a particularly important one, and we'll see more of this in the next lecture. Uh, but let me first show you the equivalent implications. So what we'll show is that the eigenvalue condition is equivalent to the C4 condition. So that's, that's the goal. So we'll show equivalence between eig and C4. So first, it implies a C4 condition because up to so instead of counting C4s, which is a little bit actually not, it's a bit annoying to do actual C4s, just like earlier, we want to consider uh, homomorphic copies, which are also labeled walks, so closed walks of length four. So up to a cubic error, and the number of labeled C4s is given by the number of closed walks of length four, which is equal to the trace of the fourth power of the adjacency matrix of this graph. Okay, and the next thing is super important. So the next thing is this is sometimes called the trace method. That one important way that the eigenvalues so or the spectrum of a graph or matrix relates to other combinatorial quantities is via this trace. So we know that the trace of the fourth power is equal to the fourth moment of the eigenvalues. 
Right? So if you haven't seen a proof of this before, I encourage you to go home and think about it. Right? So this is, this is an important identity. Of course, four can be replaced by any number up here. And well, now you have the eigenvalue condition. So I can estimate the sum. There's a principal term, namely lambda one. Right? So that's the big term. Everything else is small. And the smallness is supposed to capture pseudo randomness. But the big term you have to analyze separately so the big term, okay, so let me write it out like that. So the big term, you know that it is p to the 4, n to the 4, plus little o of n to the 4. Okay, so the next thing is what to do with the little terms. So we want to show that the contribution in total is not too big. Okay, so what can we do? So let me first try something. Right? So first, well, you see that each one of these guys is not too big. So maybe let's bound each one of them by little o of n, so raised to 4. But then there are n of them, so you have to multiply by an extra n. And that's too much. That's not good enough. So you cannot individually bound each one of them. And this is a this is a novice mistake. Right? So this is something that we'll actually we'll see this type of calculation later on in the term when we discuss Roth theorem, but you're not supposed to bound these terms individually. The better way to do this, or the correct way to do this, is to pull out just a couple, you know, some but not all of these factors. So it is upper bounded by you take max of in this case, you can take out you know, one or two, but you take out, let's say, two factors, and then you leave the remaining sum intact. In fact, I can, leave, I can even put lambda one back into the remaining sum. So, so that is true. So, so what I've written down is just true as an inequality. And now I apply the hypothesis on the sizes of the other lambdas. So the one that I pulled out is little o of n squared. And now, what's the second sum? That sum is the trace of a squared, which is just the twice the number of edges of the graph. So that's also, at most, n squared. Okay, so combining everything, you have the desired bound on the C4 count. Of course, this gives you an upper bound, but we also did a calculation before the break that shows you that the C4 bound is, has a lower bound as well. So really having the correct eigenvalue, um, actually, no, I mean, this already, already shows you that the C4 bound is correct in both directions, right? because we, this is the main term, and then the, everything else is small. The final implication is C4 implies eigenvalue. So, okay, for this one, I need to explore this following important property of the top eigenvalue. Uh, so this is something that we also saw last time, which is the interpretation of the top eigenvalue of a matrix interpreted as So this is sometimes called the Coran Fisher criterion, or they're actually, this is a special case of Coran Fisher. Again, this is a basic linear algebra fact. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend looking it up. Uh, that the top eigenvalue of a matrix, uh, of a real symmetric matrix, is characterized by the maximum value of this quadratic form. Um, let's say if x is a non-zero vector. So in particular, if I set x to be a specific vector, I can lower bound lambda 1. Okay. So if we set 
this bold face one to be the O1 vector in R raised to the number of vertices of G, then the lambda one of the graph is at least this quantity over here. Well, the numerator and denominators are all easy things to evaluate. The numerator is just twice the number of edges uh, because you are summing up all the entries of the matrix. And the uh, denominator is just n. So the top eigenvalue is at least roughly pn. Okay, so what about the other eigenvalues? Well, the other eigenvalues, I can again refer back to this moment formula relating the trace and closed walks. It is at most the trace of the fourth power minus the top eigenvalue raised to the fourth power. It's a, the sum of the other eigenvalue raised to the fourth power. And four here, we're using the four as an even number. Right. Okay, so you have this over here. So having a C4 hypothesis and also knowing what lambda one is allows you to control the other lambdas. So lambda one cannot be greater than, much greater than Pn. Also comes out of the same calculation. Yep. Uh, so the, the theorem, mm -hmm. lambda one equals to two plus O one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so there's a correction. So lambda one is, so in other, yeah, so in other words, the little o is always respect to the constant density. Yeah, question. Uh, you said in the uh, eigenvalue in hmm. pi C4, yep. you somewhere also use the lower bound to get true? Okay, so the question is in eigenvalue implies C4, uh, says something about the lower bound. So I'm, I'm not saying that. So as written over here, what this is what we have proved. Right? So in, but in, when you think about the pseudo randomness condition for C4, it shouldn't be just that the number of C4 count is at most something should be that it equals to that, which would be implied by the C4 condition itself because we know always it is the case that the C4 count is at least compare what it is compared to the random case. Yeah, All right, so just one more thing I said was that lambda one, you also know that it is at most Pn plus little n Because, well, um, okay. yeah. So this finishes the proof of the chung Graham wilson theorem on quasi-random graphs. So we stated all of these hypotheses, and they're all equivalent to each other. And I want to emphasize again, the most surprising one is that C4 implies everything else that a fairly weak seeming condition, a seemingly weak condition, this just having the correct number of copies of labeled C4s is enough to guarantee all of these other much more complicated looking conditions. And in particular, just having the C4 count correct implies that the count of every other graph H is correct. Now, one thing I want to stress is that the chung Graham wilson theorem is really about dense graphs. And by dense here, I mean P constant. Of course, the theorem as stated is true if you let P equals to zero. So there I said P strictly between zero and one, but you know, it is also okay if you let P 
be equal to zero. Well, you don't get such interesting theorems, but, but it, it is still true. But for sparse graphs, what you really want to care about is approximations at the correct order of magnitude. So what I mean is that you can write down some sparse analogs for p going to 0, so p as a function of n going to 0 as n goes to infinity. So let me just write down a couple of examples, but I won't do all of them. You can imagine what they should look like. So this should say this quantity over here, the, in the discrepancy condition, is little o of p n squared, because p n squared is the edge density over o. So that's the quantity you should compare against, and not n squared. If you're comparing n squared, you know, you're cheating, right? Because n squared is much bigger than the actual edge density. Likewise, the number of labeled copies of H is, I want to put the little o, one plus little o in front So instead of plus little o of n to the h at the end. So you understand the difference. Right? So for sparse, this is the correct normalization that you should have when p is allowed to go to 0 as a function of n. And you can write down all of these conditions. right? I'm not saying there's a theorem. You can write down all of these conditions. And you can ask, is there also some notion of equivalence, I mean, so are these corresponding conditions also equivalent to each other? And the answer is just emphatically no, absolutely not. Right? So all of these equivalences fail for sparse. Some of them are still true. And some of the easier ones that we did, for example, the two versions of disk are equivalent, well, that's still OK. And some of these calculations involving cauchy shorts are, you know, mostly still OK. But the one that really fails is the counting lemma. And let me explain why with an example. So I want to give you an example of a graph which looks pseudo-random in the sense of disk, but has no C4, let's say C3 count. Also has no C4 count, but I'll just show it has no triangle, has the incorrect number of triangles. All right, so what's this example? So let P be some number which is little o of 1 over root n, okay, so some um, decaying quantity of, with n. And let's consider GMP. Well, how many triangles do we expect in GMP? Okay, so, so let's think of P as just slightly below 1 over root m. So the number of triangles in GMP in expectation is, okay, so that's, that's the expected number. And you should expect the actual number to be roughly around that. But on the other hand, the number of edges is also expected to be, okay, so this quantity here, and you expect that the actual number of edges to be very close to it. But P is chosen so that the number of triangles is significantly smaller than the number of edges. Okay, so asymptotically smaller, fewer copies of triangles than edges. So what we can do now is remove an edge from 
each copy of a triangle in this GNP. We removed a tiny fraction of edges. because the number of triangles is much less than the number of edges. We remove the tiny fraction of edges. And as a result, we do not change the discrepancy condition up to a small error. So the discrepancy condition uh, still holds. However, the graph has no more triangles. So you have this pseudo-random graph in one sense, namely of having discrepancy, but fails to be pseudo-random in a different sense, namely it has no triangles. Yep. Do the conditions C4 and turn degree also hold here for the issue being from the same graph? Okay, question, do the conditions C4 and code degree still hold here? Basically, downstream is okay, but upstream is not. Okay, so you can go from C4 code degree to disk, but you can't go upward. And understanding how to rectify the situation, may perhaps adding additional hypotheses to make this true, uh, so that you could have counting lemmas for triangles and other graphs in sparser graphs, that's an important topic. And this is something that I'll discuss at greater length in not, le not next lecture, but the one after that. And this is in fact related to the green tau theorem, which allows you to uh, prove similarities theorem among the primes. That the primes contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions because the primes are also a sparse set. Okay, so it has density going to zero, it's density decaying like one over log n according to prime number theorem. But you want to do regularity method. So you have to face this kind of issues. Okay, so just so we'll discuss that more at length in a couple of lectures. But for now, just a warning that everything here is really about dense graphs. The next thing I want to discuss is an elaboration of what happens to these eigenvalue conditions. So for dense graphs, in some sense, everything's very clear from this theorem. Like once you have this theorem, they're all equivalent. You can go back and forth. And you, know, you lose a little bit of epsilon here and there, but everything's more or less the same. But if you go to sparser world, then you really need to be much more careful and we need to think about other tools. And so the remainder of today, I want to just discuss one fairly simple but powerful tool relating eigenvalues on one hand and a discrepancy condition on the other hand. Right, so you can go from eigenvalue to discrepancy by going down this chain, but it's actually, there's a much quicker route. And this is known as the expander mixing lemma. Right. For simplicity, and really will make our life much simpler, we're only going to consider deregular graphs. Okay. So here, deregular means every vertex is degree D. Same word, but different meaning from epsilon regular. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Right, so D regular, and we're going to have N vertices. And the adjacency matrix has eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, arranged in decreasing order. Let me write lambda as the maximum in absolute value of the eigenvalues except for the top one. In particular, this is either the absolute value of the second one or the last one. As I mentioned earlier, the top eigenvalue is necessarily D because you have an O1's vector as an eigenvector. 
Okay? So the expander mixing lemma says that if I look at two vertex subsets, the number of edges between them compared to what you would expect in a random case, so just like in a disk setting, but here the correct density I should put is d over n. This quantity is upper bounded by lambda times the root of the product of x and y. Okay. So in particular, if this lambda, so everything except for the top eigenvalue is small, then this discrepancy should be small. And you can verify with what we did that is consistent what we what what we just did. All right. So let's prove the expander mixing lemma, which is pretty simple, uh, you know, given what we've discussed so far relating. So there was this spectral characterization up there of the top eigenvalue. Okay. So we can let J be the O1's matrix. Okay, so let J be the O1's matrix. And we know that the O1's vector is an eigenvector of the adjacency matrix of G with eigenvalue D. So the, the eigen decomposition of J is also the O1's vector and its complement. So we now see that A sub G minus D over N J has the same eigen vectors as A G. Uh, I mean, you can choose the eigen vectors for that the same set of eigenvectors. Of course, we consider this quantity here because this is exactly the quantity that comes up in this expression. Once we hit it by characteristic vectors of subsets from left and right. Um, okay. So, so what are the eigenvalues? Okay, so the eigenvalues So A previously had eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda n, but now the top one gets chopped down to 0. So you can check this explicitly. Right? So you can check this explicitly by checking that if you take this matrix, multiply by the O1's vector, you get zero, and if you have an eigenvector eigenvalue pair, then hitting this by any of the other ones gets you the same as in A because you have this orthogonality condition. All the other eigenvectors are orthogonal to the O1 vector. All right. So now we apply the Coron Fisher criteria, which tells us that the number, I mean, this discrepancy quantity which we can write in terms of this matrix It is upper bounded by the product of the lengths of these two vectors, x and y, multiplied by the spectral norm um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not quite using the version up there, but I'm using the spectral norm version, which we discussed last time. It's essentially the one up there, but you allow 
not just single x, but x and y. And that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue in absolute value, which we see that it's at most lambda. Right? So it's at most lambda times size of x, size of y. Square root. Okay, and that finishes the proof of the expander mixing lemma. Right, so the moral here is that just like what we saw earlier in the, in the dense case, but for any parameters, so here there's, you know, it's a very clean statement, you can even have bounded degree graphs. V could be uh, constant. If lambda is small compared to D, then you have this discrepancy condition. And the reason why this is called an expander mixing lemma is that there's this notion of expanders, which is not quite the same, but very intimately related to pseudo-random graphs. Right, so one property of pseudo-random graphs that is quite useful, in particular in computer science, is that if you take a small subset of vertices, it has lots of neighbors. So the graph is not somehow you know, clustered into a few local pieces. Right, so there's lots of expansion. And, and, and that's something that you can guarantee using the expander mixing lemma, that you have lots of, you take a small set, set of vertices, you can expand outward. So graphs with that specific property, taking a small subset of vertices always gets you lots of neighbors, are called expander graphs. And these graphs play important role in, uh, in particular in computer science in designing algorithms, improving complexity results, and so on, but also play important roles in graph theory and combinatorics. Well, next time we'll address a few questions which are along the lines of, one, how small can lambda be as a function of d? Right? So here it says if lambda is small compared to d, then you have this discrepancy, but can it be, you know, if, you, if D is, let's say, a million, how small can lambda be? That's one question. Another question is, is considering, you know, everything that we've said so far, what can we say about, um, let's say, the, the relationship between some of these conditions for sparse graphs, but that are somewhat special, for example, KD graphs or vertex transitive graphs. And it turns out some of these relations are also equivalent to each other. 